Good evening. I'm Alan Solomon. I'm the Dean of the Jonathan Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts University. Welcome to tonight's conversation as part of Tisch College's Distinguished Speaker Series with Bill McKibben, activist, environmentalist, and co-founder of 350.org. I want to thank our co-sponsors, uh, the Tufts Office of Sustainability, the Environmental Studies Program, the Tufts Institute for the Environment, the Department of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning, JumboVote, the Fletcher School Center for International Environment and Research Policy, and the Office of the Provost. The fact that Tufts has so many groups and organizations dedicated to protecting the environment is a testament to the university's commitment to sustainability on our campuses across the country and around the world. I encourage all of you to learn more about the work of tonight's co-sponsors to find out how you can get involved by stopping by the action tables that are set up outside of the auditorium. You may have noticed them on your way in tonight. I hope you'll visit them on your way out. Um, thanks to all of our partners, and thanks to all of you for being here this evening. Uh, please, um, please join us for other Distinguished Speaker Series events that are upcoming. Republican strategist and political commentator uh, Ana Navarro on November 15th, former Secretary of State, United States Senator and Democratic Presidential Candidate John Kerry on November 28th, and, and Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healey on December 3rd. We are proud to bring to campus these and other leaders from a variety of fields, especially during this election year when it is more critical than ever to have informed and civil discussions about the issues facing our communities, our nation, and our world. For Tisch College, it's a fundamental part of our mission to teach, study, and promote participation in civic life on campus and beyond through academic courses in inside the classroom, and through programs, internships, and fellowships outside, we aim to educate tough students to solve problems and to actively participate in our democracy. Our two research centers, CIRCLE, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, and IDHE, the Institute for Democracy and Higher Education, produce some of the nation's leading studies and analysis of civic education, youth voting, and political learning on college campuses. And through multiple partnerships and initiatives, we translate this knowledge into practice by addressing some of the most malignant problems that our society faces, like partisan gerrymandering of congressional districts and threats to the environment from human activity. One of our most successful initiatives is JumboVote, a student-led effort to improve political learning and participation at Tufts. This year alone, JumboVote has helped almost 1,300 students register to vote in next week's midterm elections. <clears throat> there is a JumboVote action table outside the auditorium if you need help with an absentee ballot, finding your polling location, getting a ride to the polls, or anything else that you need to ensure that your vote is counted next Tuesday. This is a crucial time to embrace the power of voting to make a difference on issues we care about and to improve people's lives. But electoral politics is certainly not the only way to achieve change. And some issues like the environment, many, on some issues like the environment, many of our political leaders have let us down. Our guest tonight is an inspiring example of how activism can address one of the most important challenges of our times, sometimes in collaboration and sometimes in opposition to governments. Bill McKibben is a writer, activist, and co-founder of 350.org, one of the largest grassroots climate action movements in the world. Born in California, Bill's family moved to Lexington, Massachusetts, and Bill attended Harvard University, which is where he began to develop a passion for the environment that would become his life's work. After Harvard, he worked as a freelance journalist and staff writer for The New Yorker. There, in 1989, he serialized what, would what he would publish as The End of Nature, which is considered by many the first book for a general audience about global warming. 
Bill continues to write award-winning books on climate change and other topics. He's become one of America's most important voices on issues that affect, that affect the environment. In 2008, Bill co-founded 350.org, an international grassroots movement for climate action. The name refers to research showing that 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the upper limit for avoiding dangerous climate tipping point. Sadly, we passed 350 parts per million three decades ago, and today the atmosphere contains 400 parts per million of CO2. I hope I have my science right. In just 10 years, 350.org has become an influential international movement that is allied with 300 organizations around the world and has held more than 20,000 rallies in every country on Earth, except for North Korea. Maybe we'll make it there. In 2009, it organized the first International Day of Climate Action, which featured more than 5,000 demonstrations and was called the largest ever coordinated global rally of any kind. Among many other campaigns, 350.org organized the People's Climate March in 2014, which saw 300,000 people demonstrating in New York City alone. Beyond these most visible activities, 350.org works every day to plant trees, educate citizens, and petition governments to raise awareness about the dangers of climate change. For his work, Bill has received the Sierra Club's highest honor, the John Muir Award, as well as the Right Livelihood Award, the Gandhi Peace Award, and numerous other accolades. He is the Schumann, Schumann Distinguished Scholar in Environmental Studies at Middlebury College and a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. It's a long testament. <laughs> Uh, Foreign Policy Magazine named Bill McKibben to its inaugural list of the world's 100 most important global thinkers, and the Boston Globe has called him probably America's most important environmentalist, and I think we can safely remove the word probably. Moderating tonight's conversation with Bill McKibben is Julian Edgeman, Professor of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning at Tufts University. Julian is one of the world's leading scholars of urban planning and environmental social science. He originated the concept of just sustainabilities, which intentionally integrates issues of social justice and sustainability. Julian has extensive experience working with local governments, NGOs, and community-based organizations. He is the founder of the Black Environment Network, the first environmental justice organization of its kind in the UK. He also founded and now serves as Editor-in-Chief of Local Environment, the International Journal of Justice and Sustainability. Julian has authored 11 books, including Sharing Cities, a Case for Truly Smart and Sustainable Cities, which was named one of nature's top books of 2015. His published works on urban planning are among the most commonly cited scholarly works in that field. We're fortunate to have an expert like Julian leads tonight's conversation. I look forward to the insights that these two environmental leaders will share on our stage. Please help me welcome Professor Julian Adjaman, our distinguished and our distinguished speaker, Bill McKibben. Hello. Hey Bill. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, it's my pleasure, my honor to um, act as a discussant, a conversant with you. And we're going to get straight in because we think we've got 30 minutes and then we're going to open up for uh, questions from the floor. So what I want to start with really is your 1989 book. And in 1990, I bought a copy. <laughs> so I'm waiting for a signature. You're bill. dating yourself. Yeah, I, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, so the book, The End of Nature, you know, I bought it in the UK. It was a very significant book by an American um, environmentalist, an emerging environmentalist. What really got you into the issue of climate change? Well, that's a good question. Um, 
I mean, I, I was very much in those days a uh, reporter, journalist uh, above all, and partly it was sensing that this was the most important story on the planet and, and that, it, that no one had kind of written about it in sort of this way was uh, enticing. Um, I'd been reading the early science on climate change, and while I was doing that, I was living out in the wildest part of the American East in the Adirondack Mountains and deep in the woods. And so the, the, you know, the book was half uh, reporting on the science of climate change and half a kind of, oh, I don't know, lay theological, amateur, philosophical essay about how it all made me feel, which was mostly sad, um, that this you know, wilderness that I was deeply in love with wasn't, couldn't no longer be really safely described as wild, that its existence was being changed dramatically by people, though there were no people uh, there. And, I, you know, over the years that have come since, I've figured out and seen and traveled and f found many more probably crucial reasons to be upset about climate change, met many of the people who are paying the price for it the most, uh, who it must be said are almost universally the people who have done the least to cause it. Um, so other emotions, as I was saying to students earlier today, have come into play uh, along with sadness, fear, anger, some hope for the kind of world we might create. But that was the dominant emotion then. I'm going to jump straight to another question, actually, because you're kind of leading into it, and this is this fact that the people least responsible and least able to cope are in the, the forefront. Um, and so one of my interests is in climate justice. Mm. And, um, you know, this as a frame is far more evocative than climate change. Climate justice leads us to start thinking about impacts on the planet and on people. Um, so how has your thinking about climate change changed with the rise of the phrase climate justice? Well, so let me tell you a couple of stories, maybe. I remember going years ago, a long time ago, to Bangladesh because I was doing some reporting on the country that's, you know, if you wanted to pick one country that was going to be most screwed by climate change most quickly, you might pick Bangladesh. There's plenty of contenders, but, uh, you know, here's a nation that, the, you know, on average about six meters above the Bay of Bengal. It's where the, um, you know, it's watered by the Brahmaputra, which comes from the fast melting glaciers of the Himalayas, so on and so forth. Uh, that's, those are the things I thought I was interested in. When I got there, uh, they were having their first outbreak of dengue fever, uh, a disease that the WHO has said will be the emergent disease of our time because the mosquito that carries it, Aedes aegypti, is exquisitely sensitive to the changes in heat and humidity that we're now causing. So uh, this was because it was the first outbreak of dengue. People were paying a great deal of attention to it, big magnified pictures of the mosquito on the front page of the DACA paper every day and things. And because I was spending a lot of time in the slums, I eventually got bit by the wrong mosquito, and I was as sick as I've ever been. But, you know, I was strong, healthy, well-fed going into this, so I didn't die. Lots of people did. I remember going to the clinic uh, that they'd set up, and it was much larger than this room, and there were just people on cots, as far as you could see, kind of shivering there in the thing. And, and my main feeling looking out at that, and, and of course, there is no treatment for dengue because only poor people get it, so why would you need a treatment? But the, I remember looking out at this room and thinking, my God, this is unfair. Uh, when the UN tries to measure how much carbon each country emits in the you know, theory that we might someday decide to limit it in some way, you can't even really get much of a number for Bangladesh. It's a, effectively a rounding error in the calculations, even though there's 180 million people who live there. And that, I don't know, somehow that really struck me. Um, and, and that was probably the most important thing in turning me from moment, in turning me from a writer into an activist, or at least one of the things. 
So that's one story. But that f still fits in this kind of frame of like, we in the West will help take care of the poor people in the rest of the world, you know, whatever. When we started 350.org and we were trying to organize, uh, we did this day that Alan was describing where we had people all over the world participating. People were sending in pictures as they were having these demonstrations and they were coming into this website 20, 30 a minute some of the time. Well, it took about, I'd always heard, you know, in my life that environmentalism was something that rich white people did and that if you, you know, didn't know where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist because that wasn't a prior. It took about 20 minutes to realize that almost all the people that we were working with around the globe were poor, black, brown, Asian, young, because it turns out that's what almost everybody in the world is, you know. And, and what do you know? They were exactly as interested in the future as anybody, maybe more so. I mean, it must be said that uh, over time and watching how people have voted and behaved and whatever, um, it's probably easier to make the argument that affluent white people are the problem, not the solution in this case. And, and so it's been a real privilege to be a small part of a movement that basically is led by frontline communities, by indigenous people, by people in the global south, by people who are great organizers. Those are, you know, my close colleagues. So, so climate justice isn't just a kind of way of thinking about it. It's what we're going to, if we're going to win this fight, it's how we're going to win it. It's what we're going to need to get in, in order to win it. Thanks for that, Bill. And I've noticed on campus and on campuses around the country, as the concept of climate justice has been evoked, a different audience is starting to turn up at climate-related meetings. I want to move on to the IPCC's recent report. Um, <coughs> dire picture, mm. 12 years, you know all the stuff. But three key questions. I mean, what do you make of this report? Um, one of the key facets of communication is don't scare the crap out of people well this is going to so is it just going to reinforce hopelessness and and third i mean do you think this report might just be the kick in the butt that we need actually i think that it's is an important moment um the odd thing is I mean, this is really the fifth of these important IPCC reports, the first coming out, Kelly, in 1995. Well, there was but the first one that really identified, it really said where climate is changing was 1995. So we've had five of these. And it's not like really they've said anything different. I mean, our, our understanding hasn't substantially shifted over that period. What shifted is, and the reason the rhetoric has gotten different is, it's 25 years later. That is, we've wasted 25 years, not just wasted, we've, since we've dramatically increased the amount of carbon that we've put in the atmosphere, we've built ourselves a much taller task. And so I think that scientists are sort of, who are you know, the most mild-mannered in general and you know, most resistant to alarming anyone and really would like to be left alone in the lab and I, I think are finally reaching the point where they're just saying, uh, you know, excuse me, excuse me, you, you really do need to pay some attention here. So the thing that came across from this report, I think, to the public is the idea that there's a definite time limit that we're dealing here with that we've got a dozen years, as they said, to make radical transformations, or we're not going to achieve the, even the modest goals that the global community has agreed on. I think that that's, and, and I don't worry that that scares people. It does not worry me if people become scared of climate change. Um, what scares me is people not being scared of climate change. The, I mean, at the very least, if we're not going to do anything about this, and maybe we're not, then we should at least not do it with our eyes open. I mean, the single most embarrassing thing for us as a species would be to walk blindly off this cliff, you know? So I'm very grateful for the warning. But I sense that it's actually 
maybe got to people a little bit more this time. Perhaps because as we look around our country and around the world, it's, there's no possible way that anyone could read that and think, oh, well, some of our political leaders will take care of it. Uh, clearly, they have no interest in taking care of it, so we're going to have to do those things ourselves. We're going to have to build those movements, push for that action. You wrote a recent op-ed in the um, Los Angeles Times, climate politicking isn't working, we need climate civil disobedience. Can you uh, explain what you Well, mean? we need, that's one of the tools. Activists have a toolbox, and in it are many, many tools, and you don't want to use any of them over and over again, because like any tools, they get dull, but civil disobedience is a very important part of been a very important part of every 20th century movement that actually changed the, the zeitgeist because it's a way that we underline the moral urgency of things, draw attention to it. I think you can argue that, that nonviolent direct action, nonviolence, may turn out to have been the greatest invention of the 20th century. That uh, from the margins, Gandhi and Dr. King and the suffragist movement and others pioneered a series of extremely interesting techniques that have within them the capacity to help not just force change, but to convert people along the way. And so, you know, we organized at the start of the Keystone Pipeline thing what turned out to be the biggest civil disobedience action in many years about anything in this country and certainly in the environmental movement. I will say given the audience and the wonderful demographic diversity, one of the, I wrote the letter asking people to come to Washington to get arrested, okay? And which is not an easy letter to write and and one of the things I said in it was I did not think that young people should necessarily have to be the cannon fodder for this. So if you're, you know, 19 right now, it's possible that an arrest record is not the thing that you most want on your resume. One of the unmixed blessings of growing older is, after a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you? You know, <laughs> and 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 given where we are, let me add that this goes triple for people with tenure. Okay, <laughs> you are the most bulletproof people on planet Earth, so put it to some use would be my, you know. And I increasingly hear from, from people who say it's on their bucket list to, to get arrested, so uh, we can help if that's, you know. But there are, you know, an enormous number of things that need to happen, and, and civil disobedience is one of them, but there are plenty of other things that are much easier. I mean, so easy that it kills me that we're not just checking them off one after another. In the current context, the absolute easiest for a place like Tufts would be to divest your endowment from fossil fuel <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Students, and let me just say, let me just say, I think students and faculty here have both voted again and again to, in favor of this, and for good reason. Had anyone paid attention five or six years ago when students first raised it, Tufts would have far more money than it has now because the fossil fuel sector has dramatically underperformed the rest of the economy. Not surprisingly, since there's a replacement technology that's gaining speed all the time, okay? But financial stuff aside, Think about what we've learned in recent years about the fossil fuel industry. Good reporting in the last few years has demonstrated that the major oil companies knew everything there was to know about climate change back in the 1980s. They, were, they, they uh, devoted significant resources to finding out, as you would expect, since carbon was their product. And they understood what was going to happen and indeed took it very seriously internally. Uh, Exxon started building all its drilling rigs to compensate for the rise in sea level that they knew was coming. What they didn't do was tell any of us. Instead, they spent immense amounts of money building the architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation that's kept us locked in this pointless, sterile debate. So, you know, what they did was lie. What they did would get 
any student at Tufts who did that kicked out of here for lying, cheating. Okay? And the idea that that hasn't been enough to get the powers that be at Tufts to kick these guys out of their investment portfolio is maddening. I, all I'll say, and I won't go on anymore on this, but all I'll say is on the list of things that we need to do to deal with climate change, this is one of, A, the most effective. Shell put in its annual report this year that divestment was now a material risk to their business model. And B, it's about the easiest possible thing that there is to do. All you have to do is tell your investment advisors, get us in something else, you know? Um, um, I mean, it really couldn't be much more simple. And the fact that, that it isn't happening means that people really have no great room to criticize the Trump administration or anybody else. If, if we're not able to take even modest, easy steps like that, uh, uh, it's too much to hope that we're going to take do anything very difficult. I just want to press you on this, uh, this civil disobedience mm. idea because, you know, I can see white middle and upper middle class people being civilly disobedient as one thing, and if young people of color are civilly disobedient, that's a, another, um, a, another level. Um, sure. And I, I'm not thinking about the, the, the people that you're talking about globally. I'm thinking about, imagine this happened with a bunch of young kids in Roxbury. Sure. Or so that's why, that's why I said what I said about who I thought should be doing this. Uh, everybody should uh, be taking what you know, uh, things they have, what talents and resources they have and putting them to use. And one of the things that, uh, you know, older, richer, whiter people have is a fair amount of privilege about, you know, being pretty clear that no one's going to, you know, deal badly with you. And I mean, it doesn't mean that it's easy or fun, you know. I mean, I've spent enough nights now in jail to know that it's not much fun for anyone. Um, but it's not, for people like me anyway, not the end of the world. The end of the world is the end of the world. And that's why we do what we do. I think a round of applause for that will be the uh, <laughs> So we've just had the IPCC report. Mm. We've got the midterms coming up. Um, what do you think, I mean, is there going to be a role for the IPCC report? I've actually seen one or two, uh, Democrat, well, I saw one Democrat and one Republic contender talking a little bit about it. Is it going to play a role in the, the midterm? The, the things, the kind of climate questions and environmental questions uh, that are on the ballot across the country are really interesting and and powerful. There's a carbon tax on the ballot in Washington state. There's a um, really not a fracking ban, but the mere modest demand in Colorado that people not put oil wells directly next to people's homes. Um, um, these are all, these, when the campaign started, were all ahead 70-30 in you know, uh, uh, the polls, they're likely to lose now because the fossil fuel industry has poured the one thing it has, which is money, in, in unbelievable quantities. So for instance, everybody who's following the Texas Senate race and Beto O'Rourke all gasped with delight when it was revealed that he'd raised $38 million for his, and people said, that's unbelievable, it's the most anyone ever. In Colorado, where that modest fracking setback law, the fossil fuel industry has so far spent $38 million in a state with one-fifth the population of Texas to beat this thing. I was out there helping them last week. Every single ad on every single TV show, and they've run out of ads to buy, so the oil companies have outfitted fleets of trucks that tow mobile billboards up and down the highways day and night spreading their particular set of lies about uh, uh, this law. They're probably going to win those fights because they bring, they're managing to pollute not only the air but our politics in a very deep way. 
And it reminds us that the essential battle here, before we can do creative policy things, before we can do, you know, take advantage of all the expertise of the kind of people who are working out the public policy steps we need to take, if we cannot break the political power of the fossil fuel industry, we can't do these things. And that's why, just to go back to it for a second, why something like divestment is so important. It is aimed at precisely breaking the political power of these guys. So it's a long way of saying that, that I don't think that at least for the moment, though it's, I've been on the road campaigning for people for a month now, and if, you know, if I seem a little tired, it's because the last four days have been uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Nebraska, one day in each. Um, um, I don't think that we're at a point where we can s solve this in the ways that rationally we would, getting together in Congress and passing smart legislation and things. I think the reason to win the midterms is to so that we don't see our country just succumb to a, you know, fall into some complete new state of autocracy that we can't recover from. Um, I think it's a holding action. But I think the climate fight, at least for the moment, is going to be fought out at least as much in the financial realm, in that sort of thing, as, as politically. Not just here, but in, in much of the world. The political space to deal with this is shrinking in a lot of places. And it shrunk a lot more yesterday when Brazil elected this guy as its new president. Um, um, a, a guy who said his first order of business would be to remove all protections for indigenous land in the Amazon. Um, um, that's a fateful thing. So we've got a lot of work to do. Okay, Bill, um, sort of bringing this section to an end, um, what are some um, short-term and longer-term things that people can do? Tenured professors as well as 19-year-old students. <laughs> Look, We've been talking about this a lot today, and we really had an excellent session with students, and, and uh, Professor uh, Kelly Sims Gallagher did an excellent job of interrogating me for podcasts and things. And so in both cases, we've come to this question, and my answer's uh, I've sort of been, so I've been refining it all afternoon. It should be good now. Um, um, there's tons of individual things that everyone should be doing, and I think everybody knows them by now. If you don't, you're not, you haven't, uh, there's something wrong, because like, <laughs> we get the things that we need to be doing, but those individual things are very important to do in a sense, but they're actually no longer the solution. I mean, my house is covered with solar panels. I drove the first electric Ford in the state of Vermont, you know. Uh, I we fed my family for an entire year once, eating only food that came from our valley in, you know, in Vermont. Those are all good things, but I do not try to fool myself that that's how we're going to stop global warming. If we had, if the physics of this were different, and the danger point was 575 parts per million, and that gave us another 60 years to deal with it, then that would make complete sense. Humans and their institutions and their economies work best with more gradual, slow change. It's the least traumatic, it's the least expensive, it's just how we, how we are, you know? That would be like you put a solar panel on your roof and your brother-in-law comes over at Thanksgiving and sees it, and next year he buys a Prius and, you know, 50 years from now, we're where we need to go. We don't have that time. Time is just a physical constraint that we're dealing with. And so the most important things an individual can do is be less of an individual. Join together with other people in movements large enough to affect changes in policy and economics that might actually move the system enough to matter. You can't do it anymore, one light bulb 
one vegan dinner, one whatever at a time. You should do those things and do them for a whole variety of reasons. Like they're the morally right thing to do and they're gonna save you money and they're gonna make you more healthy and whatever. But don't do them expecting that, or considering that by doing them you've somehow done your duty. You're, you're, what we need you to be is effective citizens, moving policy. And citizenship is, you know, not been the thing we've been best at in this country in recent years, and we're paying the price in a number of places, but the most obvious, probably, and the most long-term damaging is what we're doing to the physical systems of the earth. So that's my sense of things. Movements are, history would indicate, are the one way we have of standing up to unjust, entrenched power. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. So we have some time, about 15 minutes for questions, two mics, um, no statements, no um, long-winded three-part questions like I asked. Um, and can you say who you are, um, where you're from, and just your question as quickly as possible, please. So, mm -hmm. questions, yep. You can jump up to the microphone. Well, actually, it's probably easiest. Just go up to the microphones and line up. Uh, the, I, th I, I think the, I think we're being asked for stock tips here. Any, yeah, yeah um, I think so. Any, well, uh, 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 any uh, any areas that people would want to invest in? And I mean, there's obviously there's obviously tons of money that's going to be made in the years to come in this energy transition. And you don't have to be you know brilliant to figure it out. Um, you know, we need to quickly stop burning coal and gas and oil, which needs we need to produce energy from someplace else. The sun and the wind are the two biggest possibilities. And we want, therefore, to move as much of the world's energy system to electricity as we can, uh, because you can generate electrons from the sun and the wind, and it's much easier than we can figure out ways to make liquid fuels from things. So, you know, with luck, we'll be driving electric cars, if we're driving cars at all, uh, you know, um, um, and hopefully we'll be building, like China now is, immense numbers of electric buses. Kelly, we're at like hundreds of thousands of electric buses in China now, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, if I guess if you're going to go, find some electric bus company and invest in it, that'd be my <laughs> advice, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll start there, and then we'll just Back go backwards and forwards. Hi, um, my name is Anita. I'm a senior here at Tufts, and I was just wondering, in terms of talking about divestment, I think a, an argument that's pretty commonly made is that it's not financially practical for an, inst an institution to divest completely from fossil fuels. So I was wondering if you could talk about, if you know any examples of use, successful rhetoric that you've used in, in order to counter that argument, and also maybe cases of universities sure. or institutions that have done that? Sure. I mean, so this used to be a problem back at the, for the very first adopters. It took a certain amount of courage to do this, but now it doesn't take any at all um, um, because there's so many examples all over the world. We're now at, we have uh, institutions with combined portfolios and endowments of over $7 trillion that have divested in part or in whole from fossil fuel. So this includes hundreds of colleges. More than half the colleges and universities in the UK have now divested from fossil fuel. And as I say, the ones who did it made out like bandits. Uh, that wasn't their reason for doing it for the most part, but it turned out to be an excellent side benefit um, because they invested in something else, and whatever else they invested in performed better than the fossil fuel sector did. So had Tufts done what it done when the first generation of students asked them to do it five years ago, there'd be a lot more money now for scholarships or, you know, to, to build more climbing walls or whatever it is that you want here at Tufts, you know, <laughs> you'd be all set. So, so I would not, I would not take that argument from anyone. I just say, come on. I mean, to get real would be. So that's what I Thank would you. say. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. My name is Bob Slate. I live in Cambridge. Um, 
we have a son who just graduated as a Tufts scholar, as a Tisch scholar from Tufts, and I was a year behind you at what we call the Tufts of Cambridge. <laughs> um, my, my question is simple, particularly for people of our generation. How do we talk to our children or grandchildren about near-term extinction? So it depends on how old your children are, it seems to me. Um, um, I think that actually, I'm, uh, I, I blanch when I see like books designed for small children to tell them about the environmental crisis. I think it's neither fair nor wise. My sense as a parent always was that my f one of my real jobs was to make sure that my daughter fell in love with the natural world around her. And I don't think people fall in any more than only the most virtuous people manage to like fall in love with terminally ill people because it's just too painful to contemplate what's going to happen. By the same token, people have a hard time who are deeply scared about, of falling in love with the world around them. And so I, I, I think with young kids, the job is just the opposite. It's to take them camping, it's to be out in the park, it's to grow a garden, it's to do all those kind of things, you know? But this talk is also in the air, and past a certain age, people are going to know about it, worry about it, think about it. And I've found with kids above all, um, you need to engage them in serious work, and kids are much better, the kids have a much more active bullshit detector than adult. Adults can convince themselves that the fact that they bought a Prius is somehow going to save everything, you know. Kids are much more likely to actually understand that, that we need big change. And they're completely able to play a big part in getting it. I mean, Look, when we do these organizing around the world, it's kids of, often kids of like junior high and high school age who are some of the best possible organizers. We founded, I was telling people before, 350.org a decade ago with myself and seven undergraduates, okay? And, and that's what we had. We didn't have any money. We had seven kids. There were seven continents. Each one took one. That's how we organized, you know, 5,200 demonstrations around the world. Um, so. Young people are completely able to understand, get, but just the way to get around the despair that comes with thinking about this is to engage in enough, in activity that has some plausible chance of doing something about it. Um, it doesn't always cure the angst that comes from understanding the difficult position we've put ourselves in, but in my experience, it's by far the most likely antidote to that kind of despair. Good question, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Celia. Um, we met previously. Um, so I, on the flip side of divestment, um, where would you encourage universities to reinvest their money after they've divested so that they're not reinvesting in similarly extractive and destructive industries such as the fossil fuel industry? So, so there's lots of good answers to that. And we were talking before uh, about one of the most obvious. So if, if you're the investment committee at the Tufts Board of Trustees, okay, and you're looking around for return on investment, energy efficiency here on campus, if you invest $10 million in new light bulbs or whatever, it's very easy to chart what the return on investment's gonna be, and it's in every case gonna be higher than whatever you've been getting out of the stock market, because there's, and, and, and the same is true, obviously, of investments you can make in people doing energy efficiency you know, in the community and at large. Uh, uh, those things all have terrific and very predictable return on investment. It's super easy to know how much money you're going to make. I mean, we, we think about it in terms of money saving by putting in good insulation or whatever, but that's just another way of, of saying return on investment, uh, you know. Um, um, the only reason we don't do it, as we were saying earlier, is we just have it in our minds if we're on the, that there's like, at the Board of Trustees, there's an investment committee, and then there's a capital expenditures committee, you know, or, or something like that. And, and we treat those as two separate pots of money, but they're not. So that's one place I'd, I'd look around campus and figure out 
what you're not doing yet that you could be doing, and that's incredibly easy. And then I'd look for the same kind of opportunities in energy efficiency and, uh, across Massachusetts and around the world. Thank you. Um, hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Chris Aragon, and I'm a senior here. Um, we spoke earlier, or um, rather there was a discussion earlier on outside money being used to try to tank environmental uh, mm. referendums in Colorado. And I was wondering, uh, how, how do you think, or what do you think is the best way to combat um, outside money that is used to spread misinformation and politics uh, without limiting uh, freedom of speech or freedom of expression? Well, the best way is to, in my opinion, is to put serious limits on it. In fact, were it up to me, I would say that the only people who get to vote or get to spend money on political campaigns or anything else are people. And, and I, I do not think that it makes sense to treat corporations as people in this regard, um, in part because they're, they, I mean, it, Corporations are extremely, if, if there are certain tasks that they're extremely good at, right? If you want something to, I think I won't answer this. <laughs> I'll try to turn it off. Um, um, if you want something done efficiently, if you want to go uh, find oil all around the world and bring it back, at a, a corporation is a terrific vehicle for doing this, okay? It's set up to do that. It has, you know, all kinds of, why that's, it. but if you want somebody to think thoughtfully about whether going and finding oil is a good idea or not, don't ask a corporation. It doesn't make any sense to do that because it's, it's set up to do one thing and one thing only. It's as if, you know, it's like if you want to make honey, you know, find bees. They're incredibly good at it, and they'll dedicate every possible resource to it, and that's what they'll do around the clock, and they'll produce it beautifully. But if you want to have a discussion about whether or not we should keep making honey, don't ask bees because you, <laughs> they only have one answer, and they're just going to keep repeating it over and over and over again. So I wouldn't let them, I mean, if it were up to me, I'd let them play no role at all. Um, we're not going to get there in the immediate future. They're Political power is enough that they can maintain the current system for the moment. So in the meantime, the only way to counter it is with massive amounts of people organizing, standing up to them, trying to defeat them in, in electoral battles, and then in between elections. One of our problems is that we tend to think that politics and elections are exactly the same thing. Um, and look, in the autumn of even-numbered years in America, the most leverage you can have is at the ballot box, and it would make no sense for people not to take full advantage of campaigning and voting, and I'm awfully glad you're doing jumbo vote and everything else, but November 7th or November 7th is going to be just as important a day in the political calendar and November 8th and November 9th and November 10th because we move on to other kinds of tasks then. So organize, organize, organize. I'm a broken record, but that's a good question and thank you for it. Thank you very much. I'm Sue Donaldson. I'm with the Cambridge Node of 350 Massachusetts. And um, I have a question about civil disobedience. We, we and other groups in recent years have uh, done our share. We have sat in in our governor's office. We have jumped in front of machines that were making natural gas pipeline extensions. And in all honesty, the, the um, result of that has not been encouraging. The governor ignored us and the pipelines get built. So I guess I'm looking for a little coaching. Do we need bigger? More people? Do we need more dramatic actions? Um, so, what, what are we doing wrong? Well, first of all, let me just say enormous thanks, and for all that you all are doing. Um, and 350 Massachusetts and the Better Future Project and things are great resources that people should join in and help because they're getting a ton done. That said. Civil disobedience isn't, 
it's not magic, you know, and none of this stuff works guaranteed every time, you know, out of the box. But the work that you're doing actually is really important. Even when we don't win these fights, we exact a high price for fighting them. So let me give you an example. We started the Keystone thing seven years ago. It was the first one of these, first time anybody had ever really stood up to the fossil fuel industry, the oil industry, and said, we don't want a piece of infrastructure. So they were completely unconcerned by it. Uh, the National Journal, which is sort of the trade paper in D.C., polled its 300 energy insiders that summer, and 91% said TransCanada would have its permit by the end of 2011 to build this thing until 1,200 people went to jail, and those 1,200 people going to jail catalyzed people resisting in a thousand other ways. You know, huge demonstrations, endless letter writing campaigns, being in touch with Democratic donors all the time to make sure they were assailing public officials. I mean, there were, uh, you know, uh, cultural resistance of all kinds. I mean, it took an enormous army. And the result is, so far, Keystone's not built. Um, we don't know if it will be. I was just in Nebraska. We were busy campaigning for the Public Service Commission, Nebraska, because if we get a third vote there, it's possible they'll be able to block it, and that will be nice. But the real result was that every single thing that the fossil fuel industry now does, pipelines, frack wells, coal mines, LNG terminals, you name it, gets fought and fought hard. We win a fair number of those battles. You know, those 3,000 kayaktivists who clogged Seattle Harbor, uh, blocking Shell's oil rigs from going to the Arctic, imposed a high enough brand reputation cost that Shell pulled the plug on drilling up there. We're going to have to do the same thing because BP and others are planning to go into the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge soon and drill. But we win a fair number of these things. We've blocked so far all six proposed coal ports along the west coast of the United States to the point where the Trump administration last week started floating the idea that they were going to convert military bases to make them into coal ports, something I don't think they'll be able to do, but it demonstrates how successful people have been. But even when we don't win, the mere fact that it that they have to plan for it, that it takes huge amounts of money, that it delays the things that they're doing, those are really important. So the head of the American Petroleum Institute, or one of the big lobbying groups, speaking last year to his a group of his peers at a conference, said, we have to somehow stop the keystoneization of everything that we're trying to do, okay? I confess that was music to my ears, and a reminder, a sort of vote of thanks to everyone like you who have done that work and made it count. And I will say again that, that this is true of all kinds of fights. So tough students haven't yet won the divestment battle. That doesn't mean that all the activism they've engaged in has been for naught or wasted, because every time they've done it, it's raised this issue for hundreds more people. Every single time the Board of Trustees doubtless composed of eminent and powerful people meet, they have to deal with the fact that people are demanding this kind of change. I mean, this is how movements get built, and the prize in the end for movements is not particular victories. The prize for movements in the end is changing the zeitgeist, changing what people perceive as obvious and natural and normal and what's coming next. And we're on the verge of that, we're going to win that fight. The question in my mind and the things that haunts me is whether we're going to win it in time or not. And that I can't tell you because part one variable is how well we do our job, and the other variable is how physics plays out on planet Earth. And neither one of these do we know to a specificity that gives us the right to stop doing what we're doing yet. So thank you. <clears throat> Good. Quick fire. So we've got, uh, we've got about four minutes left. Can we have some really quick fire questions? The, the problem's not with the questions. The problem's with the answers. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it. Uh, 
In light of your earlier mention of uh, dengue and how climate change will impact the spread of um, mosquito-borne and other diseases, I was wondering if you could discuss um, what type of emerging public health threats we're going to see because of climate change. You name it. Uh, you know, um, um, look, in general, a world that gets warmer and more humid is a world that's of immense attractiveness to uh, <laughs> bugs and microbes of all kinds. And I mean, we've already seen, you know, one after another. I mean, Zika was a perfect example of a disease that spread in large part because the range of this mosquito had spread and will continue to spread. In our part of the world, uh, the spread of Lyme disease over the last couple of decades has been com directly linked to the fact that we no longer have cold winters enough to knock down tick populations. And the effect has been, it's worth thinking about, not just all the people who've gotten Lyme disease, of which there are now millions, and sometimes it's really terrible. It's also the fact that for every single person who lives in this part of the world, our psychological relationship to the world around us has shifted to the point where people are a little bit scared and trepidatious of going into the woods or into walking through a field, and that's a great, great loss. But we could do, I'm afraid I could make this list go on all day and all night. Among other things, one of the things that we clearly are seeing a big uptick in is major natural disasters. And one of the things that follows every major natural disaster is a horrible, you know, I mean, that's when you, that's where cholera comes from. That's where, you know, just one after, you know, just name the thing and it's going to get worse. So that's a cheerful question that you've asked. <laughs> Do you think that the narrow sort of profit motive of capitalism can go hand in hand with environmentalism, or do we need a new economic system? Well, whether or not we need a new economic system, it's not, it's not wise to, I think, to, to wait until we have a new economic system in order to try and address climate change. I'd sort of turn it around. I was saying to people earlier, I think the way to think about it is, if you're serious about getting a new economic system, one of the ways to do it is to try and work hard in this direction of dealing with climate change. Uh, because things like sun and wind, because of their more local and diffused nature, really change the political paradigm a lot. Think about a world that didn't have, where the Koch brothers who are our biggest oil and gas barons, didn't have a steady source of income, and hence had not been able to be the most important political players, and had not been able to spread their particularly pernicious variant of capitalism uh, uh, with its kind of libertarian excess for the last 30 years, um, that would be a different world. It wouldn't be a completely different world, but I, it would be, it would be, one of the biggest steps in that direction that, that I can see. Partly this is just because I don't know like how do one goes about just like let's change the economic system. I can sort of picture how one goes about replacing fossil fuel with sun and wind for a variety of reasons. The book I'd go read about all this is by my dearest friend in all this work, Naomi Klein. Uh, the book's called This Changes Everything, and I, I think it's a great primer on how to think about some of this stuff. Thank you. Um, I'm from Divest BU, a student movement, Divest student movement on campus at Boston University. And our billion dollar endowment has already divested from coal and tar sands. Um, we're trying to focus on a reinvestment proposal. So Good. I'm wondering how would you go about supporting the case for further uh, reinvestment of our endowment funds? Well, I, th I think that you would do it by trying to get across, A, that these are good and wise investments at these point at this point and and be that they're very consistent with BU and by this point virtually every other college's rhetoric about their great desire for sustainability and addressing the future and so on and 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 that's as it should be colleges should be thinking more about the future than any other institutions in our society because their ostensible purpose is to train people who are going to go out and be, you know, inherit the future. So it makes 
only makes sense that their investment portfolio, like all the other aspects of campus, reflect that sense of the world. If they're not investing in things that build the kind of world that will be useful and healthy for the people who are there now, then they're not doing that job. Then, they're, then they've failed in their, literally their fiduciary duty uh, uh, to think about what that means is thinking about the future. So that's how I think that's the rhetoric I'd use to get people really on board with that reinvestment. Thank you for your work at BU Go Terriers. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. And the last question. Yeah. Um, so I often find that climate news sometimes becomes yesterday's news really quickly when mm. it's not in the environmental community and mm -hmm. environmental discussions. Um, so we were talking about earlier how 70% of people are aware of the problem of climate change, but I guess my question is how do you continue and to get these people involved and maybe just to get these people involved in general and make sure that these discussions are pressing and continue. So one of the problems in our world right now is that every piece of news becomes yesterday's news really fast, you know? It's like, <clears throat> you know, we've forgotten, you know, it was like four days ago that, that half the important political leaders in the country were getting pipe bombs in the mail, and it's already like, well, I, I sort of remember that, you know? Um, um, and that's, truthfully, that's one of the strategies uh, of the truly horrible people currently running our country. Um, you know, it's a, it, it, there's no, doubt that that's, you know, that changing the subject constantly is one of the things that Donald Trump does best. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's important to try and pick a few crucial grounds on which to fight and then just keep repeating those messages over and over again. It's one of the reasons, oddly, that um, Bernie Sanders was such an, is such an effective politician. He, uh, as someone who's lived in Vermont for a long time, I can tell you that he literally says the same thing <laughs> in every speech, every time, all the time. And that's actually a smart tactic. In the same way that, you know, no, you know, like soft drink company ever just like bought one ad and they buy, they have an ad campaign and they repeat the same message until it's, you're fully internalized and you've, some part of you has come to believe that Coke adds life, you know, or, or whatever it is. So, so that's one of the reasons that, you know, things like say civil disobedience sometimes can be important because they help reinforce these messages, keep them in front of people, convince people of their seriousness. It's why things like divestment are real. It's why you have to keep, and just don't be afraid to be boring some of the time, you know, to, because you need to just keep telling people, yeah, I know I get it, whatever, but this is important. Um, this is the most important thing. One of the things about climate change is there's never a day when it's the most important thing that's happening that day, okay? But every day, it's the most important thing that's happening. And someplace in that paradox, we have to find the political will to do something about it. And I just really want to end just by thanking all of you, but thanking particularly those people who are engaged as citizens in these fights, citizens of this country, of this world, citizens of this state, citizens of this campus. Um, um, along with all our other work in the world, our work as citizens is really important. And it's why it's, I'm glad to be here at this school that takes civic life as, as its watchword. Um, 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 I'm not gonna tell you that we're gonna win this fight, because I don't know. Nobody knows. This is a different kind of fight than we've been involved in before. I mean, Dr. King was always able to end every speech by saying confidently, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. This may take a while, but we're gonna win. We don't have that luxury in this particular fight. The arc of the physical universe is, appears to be fairly short and to bend toward heat. And if we don't 
win this fight soon, then we will not win it. So that's why the urgency feels very real, and it's why I do what I do every day. I know it's why you do what you've done over a long and distinguished career for which many, many, many thanks. And thank you, too, for this excellent conversation tonight. Thank you, Bill McKibben.